proudly we hail. Hello from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. This is C.P. McGregor speaking. Welcome to another performance of Proudly We Hail, a program of your War Department. Through the courtesy of the Hollywood Coordinating Committee, we present the well-known actor, Mr. Gene Lockhart, who will star in our play, His Honor Pays a Debt, written by Tom Petty, with music by Eddie Scrivanik. <laughs> Judge Robert E. L. White is Grand City's most distinguished citizen. He's slated to quit the bench for the United States Senate in the next election. But right now, he's about to drown in plain sight of his summer cottage. Help! Quit yelling. I'm not going to drown. I went out too far. Grant, I, I can't make it. When fighting, or we'll both drown. Sorry, mister, it's the only way. <laughs> Sure now. Yes, I'm, I'm afraid I lost my head out there. I owe you my life, my boy. My life. Forget it. Are you uh, all alone? Why, yes, that's that's my place. Over there. Anyone in it? Servants? Your family? Uh, no, I I came down alone for the weekend. Uh, but don't worry, I, I'll be all right. Uh, what's your name, my boy? Never mind my name. I'll never forget you. I'm Judge White, son, and... I owe you my life. Look, I'm not here. Nobody pulls you out of the water. You say you want to do something for me? Okay. Forget you ever saw me. Say, I, I have seen you. Uh, I've seen your picture in the papers. I'm asking you to forget it. Uh, you're Tad Dexter. I was a fool to go after you. All right, set the cops on my trail, but I didn't kill Mr. Johnson. Then why did you run away? I don't ask you to believe me. I don't ask you to do anything except to forget that I'm on this island. Son, it doesn't make any real difference whether I believe in your guilt or innocence. It's my duty to report your presence here. You wouldn't. Why don't you give yourself up, Tad? Face this thing. I'll help you. <laughs> Not a chance. The cards are stacked. I'm taking one of your boats and heading for the mainland. And you can't stop me. I could. There's a telephone in my cottage. And... You do that after I've saved your life? I'll tie you up. Well, that might mean my death. it would be several days before anyone came to look for me. You win. I can save your life, but I can't take it. I'll have to take my chances on getting away. No, Tad. I'm going to do something I've never done before. I'm... I'm going to risk my career, my chance to sit in the Senate. We'll forget we ever met. Thanks, mister. I'll take the chance. But if you double-cross me... Won't you sit down, please? Thank you, Judge White. I, I'm Virginia Reed. Your note said you wished to talk with me about a young man named Tad Dexter. Tad's coming up before you on a murder charge, Judge White. In the Johnson case. No, Miss Reed, I won't be able to hear the case. I'm going on my vacation. You can't go away, Judge White. You can't. And why can't I, young lady? What do you know about this case? Tad was on his way to the sheriff's office to surrender when he was captured. You've got to believe me, he didn't kill Mr. Johnson. A lot of people think he did, Virginia. And running away didn't help. Uh, if he really was trying to surrender... Oh, he was. You've got to believe in Tad. Y you must have believed in him once, or you wouldn't have helped him get away. I, I love him, Judge White. Mm. He gave me my life when he pulled me out of the lake. I did what I had to do, let him go. Even though by doing so, I became a partner to the crime he's to stand trial for. Now, Virginia, you, you see why I couldn't hear his case. I'm afraid you're going to have to, Judge White. Huh? Well, oh, that, that sounds like blackmail, young lady. Did Dexter's lawyer send you to see me? No. Only Tad and I know what happened on your island. We haven't told anyone that you helped him escape. Yet. Oh, but you would. You'd tell Dexter's lawyer? I'd do anything to help Tad. Suppose I did hear the evidence. There's not much I could do. A jury will decide whether your friend is guilty or innocent. Oh, Tad will be satisfied for you just to hear the case. I'm not a man who forgets easily, Virginia. 
I owe Dexter a debt. I'm going to pay it. Conscience is a severe taskmaster, but a man must first of all be honest with himself. Clerk of the court's office, please. Hello? About the Dexter trial, the young man accused of killing the banker, I believe his name is Johnson? Yes. I think I'll be able to handle it. My vacation plans have been changed. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I wanted to commit myself before you, Virginia. Someday, maybe I'll know whether I'm doing this for you and young Dexter or myself. <laughs> We pause briefly from our story starring Jean Lockhart to bring you an important message from your war department. Suppose we test your knowledge. Write down a list of the world's latest scientific and technical discoveries. Then after each, write the name of the organization responsible for its development. Let's take radar, penicillin, atomic power, night vision, jet propulsion, supersonic planes, and automatically controlled aircraft. Yes, the answer in each case is the U.S. Army. If that fact surprises you, you're in for a great many more surprises in the future. Our Army is maintaining a program of discovery and experimentation. Army technicians are engaging in continual scientific research unequaled by any other organization. Trained men educated in the fields of medicine, engineering, physics, aviation, and many other branches are doing this work. All ambitious young men between the ages of 17 and 34 should take advantage of this opportunity. Go to your nearest Army recruiting station now. They'll be glad to tell you more about a good-paying, worthwhile career in the regular Army. Now, Act Two of His Honor Pays a Debt, starring Gene Lockhart. Dexter's trial before Judge White is over. The jury is out, and things aren't going too well for him. Judge White and Virginia are talking in his chamber. The evidence is all against Dexter. If it wasn't for you, Virginia, and my conviction that a murderer never would have saved my life, I'd almost believe him guilty myself. Oh, we've got to do something, Judge White. I've tried every day to see Mrs. Johnson, but she's still suffering from shock. And it's been weeks since Mr. Johnson's death. Let's see. Two doctors testified she was too ill to appear in court, and her sworn statement was read by the prosecutor. Mrs. Johnson said when she walked into the library, her husband was dead, and Dexter was standing a few feet away with a pistol in his right hand. And that, coupled with the row at the bank and the $30,000 shortage, makes things look pretty black for Dexter. Oh, but he didn't do it. Mrs. Johnson is hiding something. Yes? Yes, I'll talk with the prosecutor. Hello, Bradford. No, I can't see you. I'm in conference. What? You'll do what? If I was on the bench, I'd have you cited for contempt. I don't care what you think. Has the jury returned? No, that was Bradford, the prosecutor. Oh. He's threatening to ask a higher court to call this a mistrial because of my charge to the jury. He's right, Virginia. Well, I thought you were only fair. I did something in the courtroom that I've never done before. I allowed my own feelings, prejudice, to find its way into my speech to the jury. Now it seems that I've done little good for anyone, neither Dexter nor myself. Will the jury return a verdict tonight? No, it's too late. We have to wait tomorrow for the verdict. Why don't you go home? I'm not going home. I'm going to see Mrs. Johnson if I have to sit on her doorstep all night. Why, why are you so sure that she's the key to prove Dexter's innocence? Because Tad would never have run away if she hadn't screamed, you killed my husband. Oh, I know he had the pistol in his hand, and he told me himself he picked it up, just as anyone would pick up an ashtray that had fallen from a table. He didn't even realize he was holding the pistol until she screamed. Mm. Mrs. Johnson knows more about this than she's told anyone. I'm going to talk to her. Then you'd better hurry, Virginia, because there'll be a verdict when court convenes tomorrow morning. <laughs> We'll have order in the court when the jury returns its verdict, or I'll clear the room. Mr. Foreman, has the jury arrived at a verdict? We have, Your Honor. What do you find? We find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. <laughs> order in the court. Will the prisoner please stand? 
Under the laws of this state, Tad Dexter, you may now speak if you so desire. I... I... Oh, what's the use? Are you going to see an innocent man hang Judge White? You know that I didn't kill David Johnson. Is that all you have to say? Yes. Yes, I could say a lot of things. But that's all. Very well. Before I pronounce sentence, I have a public statement to make. It's something that has been very much on my mind for weeks. The threat of removal from office comes as no surprise to me. Many of my closest friends have expressed astonishment at my rulings and especially at my jury charge in the trial of Tad Dexter. I'm not sure that my conduct was clear in my own mind in the beginning, but it's crystal clear now. What I'm about to say undoubtedly will affect my life, my entire political career. I am convinced that Tad Dexter is innocent. I'm going to tell you why. A highly illegal and purely personal reason why. I believe there has been a miscarriage of justice. Judge White, Judge White, I found the proof. Tad's innocent. Will you step up, Mr. Prosecutor? We'll speak with her privately. I got in to see Mrs. Johnson and made her talk. She's been trying to protect her husband's name. He stole the money from the bank and killed himself. He left a note explaining everything. Here, I've got it right here. Mr. Prosecutor, I'll entertain a motion for the dismissal of this case. <laughs> I knew it. I knew nothing could happen to us. Something is going to happen to us right away, darling. We're going to be married. Oh, Tad, darling. But, Judge White, what's all this done to you? Uh -huh. Have we ruined your political career? No, Virginia. I'm going to be very much surprised if you haven't made me a public hero. This is C.P. McGregor speaking. So ends our proudly we hailed story starring Gene Lockhart. Before leaving you, Don Forbes has an important message for all of us. Every day we read in the newspapers of some new scientific development, some forward step in modern progress. Scientific research is moving forward at a rapid pace. and The United States Army is setting that pace. Skilled technicians compose the regular army today. They are men who are educated in one of many branches, whose work contributes materially to the advancement of science. That is why the Army is selecting intelligent men anxious to establish themselves in a career of technical development, men who can meet and accept the challenge of an ever forward-moving world. Army technical experts are responsible for such things as machines that fly faster than the speed of sound, complex calculating mechanisms that can chart the exact position of a supersonic projectile in flight, Parachutes that enable aviators to bail out of a plane going over 700 miles per hour. Here is an opportunity for aggressive young men to be members of one of the world's greatest research organizations, to pioneer in new fields of science as well as provide for national defense. The Army will teach you a valuable and beneficial trade or skill. The soldier is not only a member of a forward, progress-minded organization, but is himself a trained technician. The Army has much to offer the young high school graduate, the youth just starting out. The new revised pay schedule recognizes the fact that a regular Army soldier is engaged in vital research and development. Starting pay for a private is $75, and he gets free food, clothing, lodging, and medical and dental care. After 20 and up to 30 years, he may retire on a generous income. These and many others are the benefits of a career in our new technically trained regular Army. For more complete details, go to your nearest Army recruiting station. Thank you, Gene Lockhart, for a wonderful performance. Proudly We Hail will come to you again over this station next week. Listen in. Listen in.